Uh, this session will be brought by G Jimmy Lai, and Jimmy is an uh, engineer from in uh, Instagram infrastructure, and his recent interest is about Python efficiency, including profiling and optimization. And he's a speaker from the first year of PyCon Taiwan. And today he's give us a talk about Python profiler we built for efficiency. Let's welcome him. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jimmy Lai. Uh, I work in Instagram infrastructure. So today's talk is the slides is built in using Jupyter Notebook. You can download it in my GitHub, uh, Jimmy Lai Talks repository. Um, so let's get started. Um, Instagram is a video and photo sharing app. You can share a story with your friends. You can follow celebrities' accounts or interested topic. Um, our backend was built in Django application. Um, so we run UWSGI processes on our server. We fetch data from different type of backends, including Mancache, Cassandra, and Swift services. We try to run multi, uh, multiple number of processes to keep the CPU busy. And why efficiency? We care a lot about efficiency. We have a team focused on solving the efficiency problem in Instagram and Facebook. Uh, it's because uh, if we can run uh, the application with fewer server, we can reduce the cost of data center. And if we can respond faster to user, user will engage more with our application. So uh, efficiency is very important to us. And there are three types of performance bottleneck, latency, CPU, and memory. In t today's talk, we will focus more on CPU and latency. So uh, let's start from a simple Python uh, application. We have a few functions, A, B, C, D, and run is the entry point. Run will call function A and then function B. Function A and B will call into C and eventually calling into the time sleep. So function A calling uh, with uh, point one as the latency. Uh, so eventually it will sleep point one second. Function B call with point two as per, uh, the parameter. It will sleep for point two second. So um, traditionally we may use SIPO file to provide our application so we can run SIPO file with our module and the result will like this. Uh, we will get a table. Uh, each row is a function, so we can see our application function, A, B, C, D, and run, and also the time step was called. And we also have some metrics available, number of call, and total time, and cumulative time. So number of call is how many times this function is called, so time that sleep is called two times, and it's the only time has total. It's the only function has total time 0.3 seconds because total time means the time running this function, not including the time calling to other functions. So the other function A B C D they are just calling out another function, so they don't actually have total time, but they will have the cumulative time. So we can see. Function A has cumulative time, 0.1 second. Function B has 0.2 second because they pass 0.1 and 0.2 separately to the underlying functions for sleep. So uh, it seems work, but uh, it only collects the one step color calling information. So it, we couldn't differentiate uh, for example, we know time that sleep was called two times, but we don't know which time was slower because it's combined information here. If um, we can collect uh, each call stack individually, we, then we can know more detail. We can know uh, sleep is only uh, slower when it's called by function B. Then we can focus on optimizing the call stack from B. Um, and Let's uh, um, use some other tool to visualize the result. It will look like this. As we mentioned, since it only uh, keep, one, keep track of one step uh, color coding information, so the, the time span will be combined. And so what happened in Asingao world? Uh, Asingao is useful for reducing uh, concurrent 
for reducing latency by concurrent data fetching. So if we just convert the example function as async version, um, we, we convert sleep as async IO sleep. We, when we run it, we use gather to gather function A and function B. We also use the zipper file to collect the data. Here we can see a lot of um, unrelated um, functions show up and it's hard to read the data. If we use the same tool to visualize it, um, it will look like this. So here we don't even be able to find our application function, A, B, C, D. So we know that uh, SQL file doesn't support async out well. And we, yeah, so that's another issue. So uh, we conclude there are three limits of SQL file. First is it doesn't provide a stable timer. So by default, it uses CPU time, but CPU time may vary a lot um, when we use different hardware spec, having different CPU model, or when we run it on different CPU loads. And we also don't have the detailed call stack, so it sometimes it's not enough for us to, to figure out the actual bottleneck. And it, it also doesn't provide the async out support well. So those are the three problems we want to fix for C profile. For the first problem, stable timer, we propose to use CPU instruction counter. CPU instruction is a better matrix compared to uh, CPU time because it's more stable. In the same architecture, the CPU instruction per uh, bytecode usually it's uh, pretty close. And in Linux environment, we can use the perf event open system call to read the CPU counter from hardware. And it's a C function call like this. We can use Python binding to provide an API for Python. So in our application a provider, we can just call a Python function to read it. Um, so uh, it, our my uh, presentation environment is um, Mac. It it doesn't have the Linux uh, um, headers, so I didn't provide more detailed uh, detailed example for reading the CPU hardware counter. But if you follow the link it, uh, to run it on a Linux environment, it should work. And the second requirement we uh, need is to, we want to collect the detailed call stack. So there are two ways to do it. One is to use the Linux perf uh, in, uh, performance monitoring infrastructure to collect it. We can periodically call in perf to collect data from C Python process. Um, with this approach, we don't interfere the C Python process. We don't add overhead to it. Um, but it's harder to implement because we need to we need to um, analyze the uh, memory layout of C Python process and to figure out what's the current running uh, function in the call stack. It's harder to implement. The second approach is to just implement a callback function as provider and ingest through the profile hook, which is simpler to implement because we can just write code in Python. Um, on the other hand, it adds some overhead to the application. And in today's talk, we will use the second approach to uh, demonstrate how we build the providers in an easier way. So Python, by in the Sys module, provides two functions for uh, provider hook. One is uh, set profile and also the set trace. So uh, we can just provide a copy function to those functions and it will be called whenever some event happen. For set profile, it will, uh, your callback will be called when function call and function return event happens. Um, and for set trace, you, you, uh, the event is more granular. It includes the every night is Python source code execution. So with the set trace, you can build a uh, nine provider. And with set profile, you can Build a function provider. Um, function provider has less uh, overhead, so we will use it in our example. Um, if you look read through the document, uh, it provides you more detail. So your callback function will be provided three arguments: frame, 
object and event type and arguments. And there are five type of event, call, return, C call, and C return. So uh, in Python, uh, Python function call and C function call are different. So a lot of the built-in function are actually implemented in C. So the function calling to those function will be C call and C return. For example, the uh, time that sleep function is actually a C function. So let's start with a simple example. Um, so um, the frame object is the object be constructed whenever there is a fun Python function call, and there are a lot of attributes. It provides uh, useful information. Uh, in this example, we try to um, read the function name from the frame object. We read it from frame f code and code name, um, and we just print it. So um, we call set profile with the callback function, and then we run our earlier example. And then after that, we uh, reset the profile function. We can see the printout is like this. So our run function is called. Then it calls A, A calls C, C calls D, and D are supposed to call t uh, time sleep. Here we see a C call and C return. So it's actually calling the time sleep, uh, but the function name is different. It's because the um, C function call, it doesn't construct the frame object. So if we want to get the function name of C function, we need to read it from argument rather than reading from the frame. We will fix those in next example. And next, we want to collect the complete call stack, and we want to use a different uh, counter uh, timer. In, we want to use CPU instruction as timer. So to collect the uh, total time of each, each function, we need to think about what we want to do with the um, uh, uh, call stack and traversal. So we can, in this example, we know uh, when a function is called, later on it will call function B. So what, and those, so the, here are two events, and each event will have a callback function being called. So what we want to do is at the end of first callback, we want to record the timestamp. And at the beginning of the second uh, event, we want to record the, the new timestamp. And we calculate the difference, which is the delta time. We want to store this time as the total time of parent caller function A, because this is the time um, running function A before running function B. So now we know how we are going to handle the delta time update when we see a call event. Let's think about how do we want to update it for return event. Return event is straightforward. We just want to add the time to current, fun current uh, function. So that means we would need a data structure to store those information. We can just use a node. So we want to build the call stack as a tree. So each node has a key, which is a string in the format of module name, class name, and function name. It helps us identify the function in a unique way. And the time is an integer. Uh, we just add, keep adding all the total time to this attribute. And children is a dictionary. Given a key of a node, we can get the child node. And we implement a provider in the constructor. We want to construct the uh, root node, which is the empty node. And then we want to keep a lookup table nodes. So given the frame object, we can quickly get the node associated with this frame object. And then in a constructor, user can provide a different timer. It's a callable. It will, when it's being called, it returns an integer. So we can provide different timer to collect different um, metrics. So we mentioned we need to handle the call and return differently. So when it's called, we want to add the time delta to the parent uh, caller node. So we can see in the very beginning of the uh, function, 
we call timer to get the current timestamp, and we subtract um, the previous timestamp, we get the time delta. We want to do it in the very beginning of the callback because um, if we do it later, we will include the time spending on this callback function, which is the overhead, not the actual runtime of our application. So we want to do it like this. And at the end of the copy function, we want to re record the timestamp. And um, we mentioned uh, for fun Python function code, we can get the parent frame from the frame object f back attribute. So we can use this to get the parent frame, and then we can just look up the nodes table to get the parent node. We just add the time delta to the parent node. And for C function call, it doesn't create a frame object. So the frame object is actually the parent coder of the current C function. So we, for C call, we can just get the nodes using the current frame. So and yeah, so and when we when we see a return function, we want to add the time delta to the current node instead of the parent node. So when we run this, and we will get a lot of data collected, um, and then we can simply write a trace traverse function to traverse through the tree to print the time we collected. So we know every node has a time, which is the total time, and then we can traverse all the children and sum up all the total time in the subtree, and we will get the cumulative time. So using this traverse function, we can traverse the tree. Uh, we still run our example. So we will see um, the output like this. So we print out a few different uh, call stack with their uh, total time and cumulative, uh, cumulative time and total time. So we can see two time slip here. The first time slip was called by function A and it has 0.1 second as total time, and the other time slip was called by B, it has 0.2 second as total time. So this is a, a much more detailed data set, and we can use this data set to identify a lot of um, uh, bottleneck and work on the optimization. And regarding a single IO profiling, it's, uh, um, it requires some other work, so we only talk about the high level idea here. So async IO will wrap the, the coroutine function as a task object. So if you use the frame f back attribute to retrieve the parent node, you won't get the actual logical parent node. You will get a function in the async IO event loop because the uh, async IO coroutine function was actually executed by the event loop function. So uh, here we provide a solution for this. You can implement the async test factory. Whenever the async task was created, we store the actual coder as an attribute in the task. So later on, when we need the actual um, coder, we can read it, read it from the task. By doing this, we can correctly restore and record the right caller note. With those uh, approach, uh, after a lot of case study, we recommend those common CPU optimization strategies. The first strategy is to always use the faster implementation for common tasks. Python is uh, very flexible. It provides um, a lot of different ways to do the same thing. We can always choose the faster way. And the other approach is to identify the very critical bottleneck and try to uh, rewrite the code to make it more faster or just um, use some technology like Cython to compile the, compile the code as C to make it fast. So um, to present more detailed example, we have some helper function uh, for the benchmark. So we can provide some uh, cases which are statement and we can run it with time it to uh, benchmark it and we also use uh, DIS disassemble to um, de decode the bytecode to figure out uh, detail 
So in the first example, we try to compare the JSON uh, loads using JSON and UJSON. We can see uh, UJSON is almost three times faster. And we can see the bytecode are the same. So the only difference is the implement underlying implementation. So UJSON is implemented in C, so it's much faster. And for string formatting, we recommend using fstring. So in Python, there are different ways to format string. You can use fstring using f as prefix of the string. And you can use curl bracket uh, for variables. And the other way is to use a modular symbol with percent uh, symbol in a string. And, or you can just concatenate strings. Or you can call the format function on a string. So if we compare those, we can f see that f string is the fattest one, and then it's a module, and then string concatenation and format. And so f string has its own unit bytecode. It's fast, and module will call the binary module bytecode, which was overloaded. Uh, it needs to check the input. If the input is an integer, it will do modular operation. If input is string, it will do the string formatting. Because of this overload, it has some overhead. It's slower a bit. And for the other two, it involves fu function call. It needs to call function to work on the formatting. So that's why it's even slower. And for uh, list take set uh, object construction, we recommend use a literal and comprehension to make it more efficient. If we compare construct a empty list using list function call versus the literal, we can see literal is four times faster because uh, function call is always uh, slower. Same for set construction and take construction. And if we use uh, the profiler to identify some critical paths, we can try to optimize it uh, by rewriting the logic. So this is an optimization I submit for, to the CPython uh, async IO module. So there is a get running loop. It's a function called very frequently. And it, it's trying to read to attribute loop and process ID. Every time it will store um, both attributes and read both attributes at the same time. So this optimization is to reduce the two attribute SS as one single attribute SS. And by doing this, it's faster. And since this is a critical path, so um, it saves CPU for us. Another example is uh, also in AsyncIO module. Um, in AsyncIO, uh, we identify the ensure future function is called very often. So we try to reorder the if condition here because most of the time when we try to call uh, async IO run or async IO getter, we are given a coroutine object rather than a future. So if we just move the is coroutine to become the first condition of the if, uh, if loop, uh, if check, then it will be much faster. So other than those, we, we can collect more information, like the call count, the timestamp for latency analysis. We can also analyze the arguments and returns to uh, figure out whether the, this function is a good candidate for adding LRIO catch. So here I will show um, present the timestamp for latency analysis. So um, to collect the detail of latency, we would want to collect the timestamp. So whenever a function starts and function return, we want to collect the start timestamp and end timestamp instead of the time delta. In that case, we will collect a lot of timestamp. The data is a lot. We need a good UI to visualize and interact with it. So D3 is a good uh, interactive visualization tool. So here is a demo. So given an API request, 
we can uh, use the custom provider to collect the data. So we will have a call stack. We want to visualize the call stack in a tree like this. We can interact with it. We can click to fold and unfold to drill into more detail. At the right hand side, it's the timeline. So we can see this API request, it took 1.5 seconds. So, and here every row is a function call. So from here you can see how long this function um, runtime spans starting from which time until which time. And we also try to use different color to uh, highlight some function could be potentially gathered with async IO to run concurrently. And each function we also collect the statistic like P90, P95 latencies. So uh, we also have a lot more uh, related efficiency work we shared in um, other Python conference and uh, tech blocks. Feel free to check it out. Um, yeah, we also upgrade to Python 3 to get 12% CPU instruction win. We also analyze the uh, frequency of Python bytecode in our runtime environment, and we identify load attribute and st store attribute and function call are the most frequent ones. So we are working on um, patching uh, CPython to make it more efficient on those bytecodes. We also have some work on memory optimization. We optimize the garbage collection and also the process management uh, for our UWSGI Django processes. Um, so uh, if you are interested in working in Facebook or Instagram, we are hiring a lot in a Asia, in Singapore. If you are a student, you can apply for intern, or you are new graduate, you can apply for uh, university graduate, and for also full time. If you are specifically interested in Instagram, we have work opportunity in New York and San Francisco. And we also have a lot more opportunity in, on Facebook side uh, in United States and other countries. Uh, feel free to check it out in facebook.com careers. And as, let me know if you have any question or you need a referral. So now it's question time. Uh, Seems to be a question about uh, yeah about the stator approach. Is there any ongoing impact to implement a built-in async function for for it? Um, I'm not sure about whether they exist something like this. But uh, internally, we uh, other than using the async task factory to set the attribute to task object, we has another approach, which is to um, modify the CPython implementation to re uh, store the caller um, somewhere in the frame object. Um, but I'm not sure if there's a PEP about this. Uh, is there another question? Oh, yeah, there's another question. Oh. Uh, so the no. question? Um, so I think uh, for long running processes, uh, you probably want to um, collect the data um, um, it, in iterations in, rather than just collect the data at the end of the request. So when we collect the data from our Python Django runtime, we do sampling because the provider adds some overheads, so we will only pick some API request to run the provider, and at the end of the um, request, after we return the response to user, we analyze the tree to collect the data. Uh, for long running processes, I guess you probably want to periodically collect the data in case you lose everything. Uh, so this will be the last question. So which part affect the efficiency of the most of the jungle application? 
Mm. So it depends on what's your focus. So our focus uh, are mainly on the data center cost. So once for a while, we are bounded by CPU. So at that time, we try to optimize uh, more on CPU instruction. We use a lot of Cyson to optimize a lot of core modules. Um, so I think this will depend on your application. Um, uh, even though it, it it's the same application uh, like web application running on Django, but the depend on the use case, the runtime could, could be very different. Uh, it seems we are run out of time, and if you have questions or just want to say hi to Jimmy, uh, we have a desk outside R1, and uh, there's lunch on the first, uh, uh, the fourth floor. So, thanks, Jimmy, for the nice talk. Thank you.